And hello everybody, thank you for joining me. This is Game God Fluent, and I'm bringing you episode one of what is potentially and probably going to be the last new Let's Play that I start. Um, I am currently playing about four or five games, and this will be the last one, most likely, that I'll start. Uh, I've been wanting to do this a lot for a while. Um, yeah, it's something I really wanted to get into, so I didn't want to wait too much longer, but it's been on my mind for a couple months now of getting into this. This is going to be Dark Sun, Shattered Lands. Uh, if you don't know about Dark Sun, it's the kind of the bridge between the Gold Box Dungeons & Dragons games and Baldur's Gate. Kind of fell in the middle there um, in terms of the year. I think it was 93 or 94 that it released. And it has more advanced features than the Gold Box and kind of is what people call like the grandfather or father of the Baldur's Gate series because it has some ideas that then make its way to the Baldur's Gate series. So we're going to be playing through this. Another epic D&D LP, which I just love. I'm a huge Dungeons & Dragons fan. But first, I thought we're going to have to look at the manual because it is a DOS box or a DOS RPG. And, um, you know, to kind of get an idea of the background and what we're going to be dealing with, it's best to read the manual for these games, I found, especially for DOS games. So I'm going to light a smoke here, and we're going to get into manual reading and uh, checking out how things work. So I don't know how much of this I'm going to read, uh, but we're going to read some of it. So let's get into the introduction, The World of Dark Sun. And we're both learning because I only took a peek at this manual. So we're learning together. So join me for this journey starting here. Athos, the world of Dark Sun, was once as pleasant as any other. But after many thousands of years, powerful mages found ways to gain power through draining the planet's vitality. At their zenith, these wizards caused the sun to transform from a pleasant yellow glow to a raging crimson fireball on the horizon. The seas evaporated and were replaced by huge basins of silt. Mines played out, rendering metal extremely rare and valuable. Scarcer still were any sources of water. The creatures of Athos were twisted by the free use of magic. They constantly adapted to the harsh, harsh conditions. New monsters emerged from the deep desert to plague the remnants of man. Now the only stable concentrations of humanity are in tightly controlled city-states. Without exception, these are ruled by vicious sorcerer kings and the last remnants of the wizards who depleted Athos. These kings call themselves gods and rule through a religious organization known as the Templars. Their rule is uniformly harsh and capricious, and a large proportion of the populace is enslaved. Only the strongest can feel any measure of safety because the Templars can condemn anyone without a trial. The few places with any freedom are isolated villages founded by escaped slaves. Though free, life in the wastelands is precarious. Water supplies can fail, marauding monsters can devastate a village, and slavers are a constant threat. Until these tiny villages can look beyond day-to-day -day survival and ally with one another, they're unlikely to survive more than a few years. Shatterlands takes place in and around the city-state of Draj, ruled by the sorcerer king Tektikitale. 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 What comes with this game? In addition to this rulebook, your game box should contain the game discs and a data card. The rulebook explains how to play and gives you valuable re reference information on characters, monsters, spells, and psionics. The discs contain the games. Install the disc by following the instructions on the data card. Okay. Using the keyboard, using the mouse. Okay, let's go to Jareth's journal. I am Jareth in... in itinerant bard lately of Draj. I had the dubious honor of spending time condemned to the arena, a noble whom my poison regretfully survived. Thankfully, my family was able to bribe a Templar with some magic fruit. While locked in the slave pens, I was able to learn about the other slaves' lives. These illuminate the great challenges of surviving in Draj. The slave most philosophical about his plight was a half-giant named Gareth, a gladiator of some repute. He had won many matches for the noble house of Tehoctal. 
he also had a misguided loyalty to his master. Thus, when a Templar came and suggested he lose his next match, Gareth broke the Templar's neck. In return, his master declared this an escape attempt and condemned him to die in the royal slave pens. He is still not bitter, but now ske seeks to escape to freedom. One of the most bizarre prisoners is the Thry Thrykreen, Tarim. She had been hunting city troops on the salt flats west of Draj when she was trapped by a powerful Templar. Rather than kill her outright, the Templar sent her to the arena so that her death could entertain the masses. While she doesn't mind the fight, she misses the hunt and the freedom of the wasteland. Seleucus was a favorite of the Sorcerer King, destined to become one of the great gladiators of his time. He was pampered and allowed to spend time unescorted in the city. Alas, his brilliance led him to temptation. The Veiled Alliance convinced him to learn the ways of the Preservers. Foolishly, he set aside his gladiator's weapons and took to the arcane path of magic. His masters were shocked and condemned him to the slave pens. I believe they hoped to force him to return to his gladi gladiatorial skills to survive. However, however, I'm sure he will not do so until he has mastered the spells of the Preserver. Alright, so this is probably the default party that starts the game. Um, I'm not going to use them, but I'll continue reading anyway. The beautiful Saria is the offspring of a foolish human slave girl and a roguish el elven caravan master. Her father left for other cities before she was born. Saria spent her youth on the street, stealing to survive. Before this life could wear her down, she, caught, she was caught picking a preserver's pocket. He took her out of the city and trained her in the east, near the volcano. She discovered peace amidst the harsh, la harsh landscape. She learned to call on the sprites of the spirits of the earth, as well as how to master the preserver's dangerous art. She might have stayed forever, but a slaver band captured her and killed her benefactor. At the auction block, she used her spells to slay a Templar. Now she lives in the pen, seeking a way back to the wasteland. Those condemned to slavery without connections such as mine can only find freedom by fleeing into the wilderness. Travelers tell me of whole villages of freed slaves, eking out an existence near small watering holes. Individually, these villagers are so weak that a city patrol or band of raiders could wipe them out with ease. There are very few slaves that have any planning or leadership ability. I believe that a strong personality could unify them into a dangerous force. I know that the Drajian Templars are beginning to share this view. I have heard rumors of a punitive expedition to clear the waste of these villages all the way to the Silt Sea. So that gives some background on the game as well, um, which has to do with uniting the slave villages and rising up against the Templars and the Sorcerer Kings. So how to play the game. Adventuring and combat. While your party adventures on Athos, use the mouse to direct their movements and action. The mouse has three modes, walk, attack, and look. Right-click to change between these modes. Notice that the cursor cycles through the icons each time you right-click. Okay. Just scroll the screen. Move the mouse cursor in the direction you wish to move the screen. The screen scrolls in that direction. NPCs do not move unless the mouse pointer is in walk mode. Note the mouse pointer is temporarily replaced by an hourglass when the game is processing your commands. Okay, so pretty self-explanatory. Walk, attack, and look. Um, you can examine objects by left-clicking on them when you're in look mode. If you can use the item, talk to it, pick it up. A box appears with a summary and with buttons showing what options you have. If only one of these options is available, for example, you can only open doors, never talk to them or pick them up. It will happen automatically instead of displaying this box. When you're in combat with a monster, you can use the look icon to see basic information about your opponent. This information includes the type of monster it is, its current state, casting charmed, held, petrified, etc., and a hit point bar indicating what proportion of its hit points remain. You can also use the look icon on a party member to bring up the view character screen. Talk, use, pick up character interaction. NPCs are characters that your party interacts with in the course of the game. Some NPCs have their own agendas and initiate conversations with the party. To speak to an NPC, click the look icon over the character. To start a conversation, click on the talk button. Okay. Mm. Conversations occur between the NPC and the leader of the party, even though the leader may say I, he or she speaks for the party. Characters that join your party. Many NPCs inhabit Athos. As you adventure, these people provide information to help your party continue its journey. They do not enter your party, though they may follow it or lead it somewhere. So there's camping. Camping allows you to rest. Rest is necessary to recover from battles and to regain spells and psionic points. Safe places to rest are depicted by a fire ring. 
to camp, move the look icon over the fire ring and left click. As you rest, characters with cure spells automatically cast them on wounded characters. Psionic strength points are fully restored, as well as all spells that spellcasters can cast. So there's training. When your characters go up in levels, they may be eligible to learn a new spell or more psionic skills. If so, a box with all the icons depicting the spells or psionics you may learn. To toggle between different spell level psionic disciplines, click the icon in the lower left corner. To pick a new psionic or spell, click on its icon. Press done when you're finished. Spells and psionics are often the deciding factor between winning and losing a battle. Knowing how to cast spells and use psionics is a very important skill and should be learned early on. The first step in, step in casting a spell or using a psionic is to select it from the cast spell use psionic screen. After you select the spell or psionic power, the cursor becomes the icon you selected. To abort, right-click one. Some spells for psionics, healing spells, for example, can be cast directly from the screen by clicking the spell icon on the target character. Other spells and psionics automatically return you to the regular game, sc game screen. Okay. Hmm. Once spells have been cast, you may also right-click on the dark sun icon to bring up a box displaying the last five spells and psionic icons used. This provides quick access to the most frequently used spells. All right. Creating your party. So there's humans, dwarves, elves, half-elves, half-giants, halflings, mole, character, mole, male character only, and thrycrane, female character only. Okay, so we'll jump ahead. Creating new characters, we'll do that in the game, seems pretty simple. Um... Psionicists can specialize in all three psionic disciplines, psychokinesis, psychometabolism, and telepathy. All the other characters can only choose one of these disciplines. Okay. Clerics can choose any one of the four clerical spheres, air, earth, fire, and water. If you click the die, it generates a random set of values for the character stats. Um, let's see. Adding previously, modifying your party, view character, inventory screen seems pretty self-explanatory. Stores. In your adventures in Othis, you may encounter shopkeepers who want to sell you their wares. When you visit a store, the regular inventory screen is displayed alongside a store screen. Stores have six item slots showing the items for sale. If there's more than six items for sale, a more button appears. When you point to an item, a flashing highlight indicates that you can afford it. A solid highlight means you do not have enough money. To buy the item, simply click on it. Mm, I guess you can probably use the look to look and see what it is. This is interesting. The game menu. View inventory, view character, spells, current spell effects. Overhead map. Center on leader, return to game, look, set preferences, load save game, exit the DOS, collapse party, walk, okay. Use psionics. Mm. To see if there's any good or evil effects influencing a character, press the current spell effects icon. Any effects your character is operating under appear in a row next to his or icon. To eliminate a good effect, simply right-click on it and it disappears. Evil effects are harder to get rid of. If any member of the party has a counterspell or psionic ability that can void the effect, cast it on the affected character. Seems pretty straightforward. Um, you can set the level of difficulty in combat. The settings are easy, balanced, hard, and hideous. Default is balanced. I may play on hard. Um, let's check out ability scores because the classes are different and thus we need to know what's good for the various classes. Each character has six randomly generated ability scores as described below. These scores fall within a range determined by the race and class of the character. The possible values range from 9 low to 24 high. Higher values also always offer greater advantages. Strength measures physical power, muscle mass, and stamina. High strength increases a character's combat ability with melee weapons such as swords or maces. Strength also determines how much a character can carry without becoming encumbered and slowed in combat. 
Dexterity measures agility, hand-eye coordination, and reflex speed. Characters with high dexterities have bonus to armor class, an indication of how difficult they are to hit. Thieves especially benefit from high dexterity. Good dex also gives bonuses when using missile weapons such as bows or slings. So, same stuff there. We know about that. Constitution measures fitness, health, and physical toughness. High constitution increases the number of hit points a character receives. Character's constitution also determines the maximum number of times that character can be raised from the dead. That's interesting. Every time a character is successfully resurrected, one point of constitution is lost. Intelligence measures memory, reasoning, and learning ability. Preservers rely on high intelligence scores. Their skill and very survival hinge on learning and using their knowledge of magic. Wisdom measures a composite a composite of composite of judgment, enlightenment, willpower, and intuition. Characters with low wisdom are more susceptible to magical spells, while those with higher wisdom have greater resistance. Clerics with wisdom 15 or greater receive extra spells. See the cleric wisdom spell bonus table. Charisma measures personal magnetism, persuasiveness, and ability to assume command. NPCs may respond better to characters with higher charisma. Now let's learn about the races. Because they're not the same races that we see, even though, like, humans, it's different for this fantasy world of Athos. So, your characters can be any of eight races. Each race has its own unique features and abilities. Some races are naturally stronger or weaker or more or less agile than others. These differences are reflected in modifications to the generated ability scores. Dwarves are short but extremely powerful. Athasian dwarves average 4.5 to 5 feet in height and tend to have a very large muscle mass. A full-grown dwarf weighs in the neighborhood of 200 pounds. Dwarves can live up to 250 years. By nature, dwarves are non-magical and never use magical spells. This restriction does not apply to dwarven clerics. Dwarves can be fighters, gladiators, clerics, thieves, psionicists, and multi-class characters. Elves are a race of long-limbed sprinters given to theft, raiding, and warfare. An Athasian elf stands between 6.5 and 7.5 and and feet tall. They are slender, lean, and generally in terrific physical condition. An elf warrior is conditioned to run quickly over sandy and rocky terrain, sometimes for days at a time. An elf warrior can cross better than 50 miles per day. Elves use no beast of burden for personal transportation. It's dishonorable among elves to ride on an animal unless wounded and near death. Elves can be fighters, gladiators, rangers, preservers, clerics, thieves, psionists, and multi-class. Half-elves are the result of intermingling of human and elven societies in the great cities of Athos. Half-elves are generally tall, standing between six and six and a half feet. Due to their mixed heritage, half-elves are often unaccepted by both elves and humans. This intolerance leads them to be self-reliant and able to survive without companionship. Half-elves can be fighters, gladiators, rangers, preservers, clerics, druids, thieves, psionists, psionicists, and multi-class characters. Half-giants. Giants dominate many of the islands and coastal areas of the Sea of Sil. In some lost millennium, as a bizarre experiment or perhaps as some sort of curse, giants were magically crossbred with humans. Half-giants are now fairly common. Half-giants stand between 10 and 12 feet tall and weigh in the neighborhood of 1,600 pounds. Their features are human but exaggerated. Half-giants can be fighters, gladiators, rangers, clerics, psionicists, and multi-class. Halflings are very short humanoids, standing no more than three and a half feet tall. They are muscled and proper toned like humans. Oh, proportioned like humans, but they have the faces of wise and beautiful children. Halflings weigh 50 to 60 pounds and are always in peak physical condition. Halflings can be fighters, gladiators, rangers, clerics, druids, thieves, slionists, and multi-class. Humans are the predominant race on, on Athos. The average human male stands between six and six and a half feet tall and weighs 180 to 200 pounds. The average human female is slightly smaller, averaging between five and a half and six feet in height and weighing between 100 and 140 pounds. Humans can be fighters, gladiators, rangers, preservers, clerics, druids, thieves, psionicists, and dual class characters. Moles are an incredibly tough crossbreed of humans and dwarves. They retain the height and cunning of their human parent with the durability and raw strength of their dwarven parent. Moles are usually the product of slave pits. They are always male. Full-grown moles stand six to six and a half feet tall and weigh 240 to 300 pounds. They have stern facial features and most moles have no hair or beard. Moles can be fighters, gladiators, cleric, thieves, psionists, and multi-class. Thrykreen are the least human in appearances of all the races. Thrykreen are insectoids, six-limbed creatures with tough, sandy yellow exoskeletons. They stand as tall as seven feet at the shoulder, have two large eyes, two antennae, and a small, powerful jaw. They are always female. Thrykreen make use of the chakcha, a crystalline throwing wedge. The chakcha 
can be thrown up to 90 yards and still return to the thrower if it misses the target. When it hits, the Chok Chai inflicts 3 to 9 points of damage. Thrykreen cannot use armor, cloaks, belts, boots, or rings due to their non-human shape. Thrykreen can be fighters, gladiators, rangers, clerics, sonuses, and multi-class characters. Interesting. Character classes. I guess we should learn about this, too. I mean, this is going to be what we're doing. Let's see. Character classes reflect the interests and occupations of your characters. A class is like a job. It's w what a character does on a daily basis. Each class has certain unique abilities and limitations. Characters may also become dual or multi-class, specializing in more th than one area at once. A dual class character is one who starts in a single class, advances to a moderate level, and then changes to a second class, starting all over again from level one. The benefits and abilities of the first class are lost until he exceeds the level of his first class in his second. The character can never again advance in that class. Only humans can be dual class characters. A human character may do this process twice, potentially allowing for a total of three classes. A multi-class character improves in two or more classes simultaneously. All experience is divided equally between each class. This, of course, means that level advancement proceeds at a much slower rate than in those characters who remain single class. Only demi-humans and thrykreen can be multi-class characters. Special note, a prime requisite is the most important ability score for a particular class. A fighter's prime requisite, for example, is strength. Characters who have an ability score of 16 or greater as their prime requisite receive a 10% bonus to the experience points they earn. Characters with more than one point on more than one prime requisite must have a score of 16 or greater in all of their prime requisites to receive the bonus. Very important. Now let's learn about the classes. Alright, 9 strength is needed. The prime requisite is strength, and all races can be this. Fighters and Athos are skilled warriors, soldiers trained in both individual combat and mass warfare. This training includes use and maintenance of all manner of weapons and armor. Fighters can use any type of armor or weapon without restriction. Thrykreen fighters, however, have certain restrictions. Fighters cannot cast magical spells, they rely solely on their strong sword arms. They can, however, use any type of magical weapon or armor. They can also use magical items such as rings and gauntlets. Fighters gain speed in addition to skill when they advance in levels. High-level fighters, as well as gladiators and rangers, are able to attack more often in melee than other types of characters. Alright, gladiator. This is interesting. Prime record is, it, is strength, but the requirements are dex 12, strength 13, constitution 15, and all races are allowed. Gladiators are the slave warriors of the city-states, specially trained for brutal physical contests. Disciplined in many diverse forms of hand-to-hand -hand combat and skilled in the use of dozens of weapons, gladiators are the most dangerous warriors in Athos. Gladiators cannot cast spells, though they can use any type of magical weapons or armor. Gladiators learn to optimize their armor when they reach 5th level. They condition themselves to use the armor to its best advantage, consequently gaining a minus 1 AC bonus. That's right, AC goes from starting at 10 downwards, so the, the lower your AC, the better. This bonus does nothing for gladiators who aren't wearing armor. Gladiators, like fighters, gain speed with experience and consequently can attack more often in melee at higher levels than other type of characters. So, characters with more than one prime requisite. Okay, they, they have three requirements, but only one prime requisite. So here's rangers, and this really looks complicated need a strength and dex of 13, a wisdom and con of 14, and the prime requisites are strength, dex dexterity, and wisdom. Races allowed are elf, half-elf, halfling, human, and thrykreen. Rangers are trained hunters, trackers, and survivalists. They are taught to live as much by their wits and skills as by their swords and bows. Like fighters, rangers can use any type of weapon or armor, though heavy armor interferes with their special abilities. They can, however, use two one-handed weapons at the same time with no penalty. Rangers, like other fighter types, gain the ability to attack more often in melee than other characters when they reach higher levels. In addition, rangers also gain some spellcasting ability. When you create a ranger, you must choose the elemental sphere that character will belong to. When a ranger reaches 8th level, he or she gains the ability to class cleric spells from his or her elemental sphere. Preservers. Intelligence 9. Prime requisite 9. Elf, half-elf, or human. Preservers are individuals trained in the arcane and mysterious secrets of magic. They cast their spells in harmony with nature, giving back the energy they take from the land. Preservers are usually poor fighters, preferring to rely on their intellect and magical abilities. They tend to hang back in battle, pummeling their foes with mystic attacks. 
Preservers cannot wear any type of armor because armor is restrictive and interferes with spell casting. Also, because they lack martial instruction, preservers are severely limited in the weapons they can use. Clerics, Wisdom 9 and Wisdom. Clerics are priests who choose to worship one of the four elemental spheres, earth, air, fire, and water. This choice dictates what spells the cleric can call upon and what type of weapons the character can use. Clerics have major access to the sphere of the element of their worship. They also have minor access to the sphere of the cosmos. This means that they can cast any spell within their own sphere and can cast cosmos spells of third level or less. However, clerics cannot cast any spells from spheres they do not belong to. Clerics generally prefer to leave combat to the fighter types, but when necessary, they can fight in melee. All clerics are trained in combat. Clerics are not restricted with regard to the armor they wear. Clerics can only use weapons that are associated with the sphere of the element of their worship. A cleric of the plane of fire can only use flaming weapons such as flaming arrows, burning oil, and weapons enchanted to burn or scald. Obsidian weapons are also acceptable because they were once fused under great heat and pressure. Clerics of the earth must use weapons of stone, obsidian included, metal, or wood, as these elements originate in the earth. A cleric of the air is restricted to missile weapons because they fly through the air. Water clerics can only use weapons of bone or wood because these are organic materials through which water once flowed. Clerics who associate with the spheres of earth and fire have the most choices as to which weapons to use. Clerics also have powers against undead monsters such as skeletons. The ability to turn undead causes undead creatures to flee in fright. Higher level clerics can destroy monsters by turning them. Clerics with wisdom 15 or higher gain extra spells as they advance levels. See the cleric wisdom spell bonus table. Druids is a class. Wisdom and charisma. You need a 12 wisdom and a 15 charisma. Available races are half elf, halfling, human, mole, and thrycreen. Druids, like clerics, are priests who worship the elements. Unlike clerics, they are responsible for guarding a section of land. Their power derives from the spirits of these lands. They have major access to the sphere of the cosmos and the sphere of their chosen element. Druids have no restrictions as to what weapons they may use. They are not allowed to wear armor, but may don items that give magical protection, such as bracers, cloaks, etc. They can use any magical items. However, unlike their cleric brethren, druids cannot turn undead. Druids with, druids with wisdom 15 or higher gain extra spells as they advance levels. Thieves, dexterity 9 and dexterity, all races allowed. Athasian Thieves run the gamut of society. Some are malcontents who prey on the unsuspecting. Others are in the employ of the nobility, plying their trade by contract in the name of a royal household or no noble family. As thieves gain levels, they become more proficient at picking locks and providing, avoiding any attached traps. Due to their high dexterity, thieves are skilled at scaling vertical surfaces such as cliffs. In combat, thieves do additional damage by backstabbing. A thief backstabs by attacking a target from the exact opposite direction it was first attacked. A backstab has a better chance of hitting the defender and does greater damage. Because they need to move freely and quietly, thieves' abilities are restricted when they wear anything other than leather-type armor. Thieves can use all weapons. And finally, psionicists. 11 con is needed, 12 wisdom, 12 intelligence, and 15 wisdom, and their prime requisites are con and whiz. All intelligent creatures on Athos have some measure of psionic ability. Psionics are the powers of the mind, powers like clairvoyance and telepathy. Psionicists are those who have devoted their lives to the study of these powers. Psionicists can fight if necessary, but they're restricted in both armor and weapons. Like thieves, psionicists can only wear leather-type armor. They are restricted to small weapons, though they can be of any sort. Short swords, daggers, short bows, maces, etc. The three psionic disciplines are psychokinesis, psychometabolism, and telepathy. Each gives access to different mental powers. As a psionicist advances in levels, he can improve in psionic power. Psychokinesis concerns physical, physical manipulation of objects, often for a destructive purpose. Psychometabolism involves manipulating the character's own body to enhance it. Telepathy deals with the defenses and attacks of mental warfare. Alright, and then we've got other characteristics. All right, let's look at this. In addition to ability scores, race, and class, characters have several other characteristics that affect gameplay, alignment, armor class, hit points, experience points, levels, and Thaco. Ooh, it's got Thaco, my favorite. I'm not saying that ironically either. <laughs> alignment is the philosophy a character lives by and can affect how NPCs and some magic items react to a character. The possibilities range from believing strongly in society and altruism, lawful good, to being anarchist anarchistic and actively unpleasant chaotic evil 
Life-threatening situation put a character's alignment to the test. Note your party characters must be good or neutral. They cannot be of evil alignment. Alignment is presented here with examples of how differently aligned members of a party face a life-threatening situation, in this case a shortage of water. Lawful good. A character of this alignment insists that everyone get an even share of water, of what water there is, even those in the party who seem beyond hope. He or she readily conceives of and accepts plans that call for unequal distribu distribution of water for the greater good of the group, but will never let the weak go dying or dying go without water. Lawful neutral. Such characters insist that everyone get an equal share of available water, but won't care one way or the other about characters that may be beyond hope. They also accept plans that call for unequal distribution of water for the good of the group. Lawful evil. A character of this alignment insists that available water be evenly distributed among the able-bodied of the group, but won't offer any, offer any to those who seem too far gone. He or she accepts plans that call for unequal distribution of water if that means more water for him or her. Neutral good character insists that everyone in the group get an even share of remaining water, even the seriously dehydrated. He or she considers plans calling for unequal water dist distribution, but has to be thoroughly convinced that the plan will ultimately benefit the party and will not hurt him or her personally. And true neutral character of this alignment wants a fair share for him or herself, but won't necessarily come to anyone's aid. He or she considers plans that call for unequal water distribution if he or she and the party benefit in the short term. Neutral evil. A character of this alignment insists on his or her fair share and is against giving water to the very weak. He or she considers plans for unequal water distribution if he or she personally benefits. My alignment generally. Chaotic good. Chaotic good character insists that everyone get an even share of the available water, even the very weak. He or she considers plans calling for unequal water distribution if he or she and those he or she likes personally get more water as part of the plan. I may be neutral good in this one. Chaotic neutral, such a character insists that his or her fair share and won't concern him or herself with the plight of those too weak to stand up for themselves. He or she considers plans calling for unequal water distribution if he or she personally gets more water as part of the plan. And chaotic evil character freely lies, cheats, or even kills to get all the water he or she can. He or she constantly suggests plans for unequal water distribution that grant him or her additional water immediately. Okay, hit points. Armor class measures how difficult someone is to hit and damage. The lower the armor class value, the harder they are to hit. Low armor class values can indicate different things. A character might be difficult to hit because he or she is outfitted with magical armor, while a monster might have the same AC because it is small and fast. Armor class changes when characters find and use new armor or shields. High dexterity improves a character's AC. Level... Thaco, we should go over this. The ability to hit enemies in melee or with missile fire is represented by Thaco, which stands to hit which stands for to hit armor class zero. This is the number a character must roll equal to or greater than to do damage on a target with an AC of zero. The lower the Thaco, the better the chance to hit the target. Note the generation of a random number is often referred to as a roll. Yeah, we know about that. An attack is successful if the random number is greater than or equal to the attacker's Thaco minus the target's AC. Thaco may be modified by things like range, attacking from the rear, magic weapons, and ma magic spells. For example, a fighter with a Thaco of 5 attacking a monster with an AC of 3 would need to roll 2 or greater. Thaco 5 minus AC equals 2. To hit a monster with an AC of minus 2, however, he'd need to roll a 7 or greater. Thaco 5, AC minus 2, 7 or greater. Bestiary. Um, I'm not going to go over the bestiary. What I'm going to do is after each episode, I'm going to make a special episode uh, that shows each creature we encountered, I think. Um, because I don't want to give them all away before we fight them. Then we've got magic. I don't want to go over magic. Because we kind of get, you know, through that ourselves. Fred Butts. Who was that? I swear. Fred Butts. On the art. Okay. And the fat man, what? On voice design. Interesting. 
All right. Um, I don't think there's anything else to really check on. I mean, we can see the racial ability adjustments table. It's significant. Psionic powers. We'll discover those throughout the game. And I guess that's it for the, for the manual. So what I'm going to do... That went quicker than I thought. After each episode, I'm going to write down as I'm playing each monster we come across. And then at the end of the episode, I'm going to make another video, like a sub-video. So there'll be episode 1 and then episode 1A. And 1A will be looking at the manual um, at the monster guide, like the, the bestiary, the monster manual. And we'll just look and see what their lore is and kind of learn more about them. I feel that will add to the LP because it adds lore and interesting tidbits about the monsters that we fight. So we'll do that. I want to thank you for joining me, and I hope you join me. If you've watched all this, well, thank you. I appreciate it. Love you. <laughs> but I hope you join me for this journey. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to get through Dark Sun, and I'm going to continue playing the other games I'm playing and continue to go through them as well. And this will probably be the last LP that I start. Um, now that the manual's out of the way, we can just go ahead and jump right into the gameplay next time, and we'll create a party. So, thank you for watching. Appreciate you checking out my channel and checking this stuff out. And I will see you in Athos. Much love, peace, and joy. So long, everybody.